Uh, well, thank you, Hannah, very much. I've been looking forward to this event for weeks. We've got some brilliant uh, speakers, and they've got very different uh, views of the problems that we face of gridlock, the ones that you've been uh, hearing about. Uh, I'm intending for this evening's event to be feeling like you're driving along in the outside lane of an autobahn, not that you're trying to leave London on a Friday evening on the M4. So we're going to have lots of energy in the room. Do people feel energetic? Are they looking forward to a bit of a debate about transport? Is there energy in the room? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. About, I wasn't sure whether to do this because I think you might think I've been paid for it, but I haven't really. I want a bit of audience participation. I was just thinking on the way here because Shell sponsors. If you're over 40 in the room, you'll remember that a little jingle that went, you can be sure of Shell. Do you remember that if you're over 40? Yes, very good. Okay, so what we're going to do, a bit of the audience, I just decided to do this on the way here. I may never be booked again as a consequence of this. So on the count of three, I want everyone over 40 to sing, you can be sure of, because you know how it goes. And everyone under 40 who's completely mystified by the entire operation, uh, you can shout Shell. If you're massively green, you can shout Wind, but Shell are very green anyway. So uh, on the count of three, over 40, you can be sure of, under 40, at the end of it, Shell. Okay, one, two, three. You can be sure of... One more time. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. You can be sure of... Ah, yeah. oh, that's brilliant. Okay, now we're all there now. We're in the mood. Okay, now I just want to ask one more question. I'm going, to be giving, I'm going to be giving cars out as prizes for brilliant questions and points this evening. Not real cars, little tiny cars. Um, so I'm going to ask a question for... Albemarle Street, the street we're in now, as it has a uh, historic significance when it comes... OK, we're going to have a vote, the first vote of the evening. My view is he doesn't get the car because he interrupted. <laughs> so all those who think he should get the car because he's clever, put your hand up now. All those who, who think he shouldn't get the car because he's a smart Alec, put your hand up now. Yeah, unlucky. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, welcome to Smarter uh, Mobility. Um, uh, we're going to be hearing, as I say, from four uh, great speakers, and we're going to be uh, hearing, a, a, he's going to try and pull all this together, the editor of Wired UK, David uh, Rowan, who's a man who describes himself as living in the future. That's fun. I must ring you up on a Saturday afternoon when I'm betting on the horses. Um, he's well-placed to comment on the ideas we're hearing tonight, so he's going to kind of pull, pull this together. I'm going to introduce all the speakers uh, as they... Uh, come up. They're going to speak for only five minutes, which is terrible, because they could all speak intelligently for an hour uh, each. And then after their five minutes, there'll be an opportunity for about three minutes of Q&A. It'll just be one round of questions. I've got those little cars for clever questions. I know somebody who's not going to be called to ask a question. Um, and then uh, David will speak. He'll pull it all together, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end, and we'll make sure uh, that we finish on time so that you can stay and have a drink and something else, uh, to something to eat, maybe. Uh, just a couple of thanks. I should thank uh, Shell, of course, for making uh, this uh, possible. You can follow Intelligence Squared, the organization that is hosting this fantastic event, on Twitter. And tonight, the conversation online, the hashtag is hashtag IQ2, that's the uh, number two, IQ2 mobility. So feel free to tweet as we go, but do make sure your phone is switched to uh, silent. Okay, so there we are. Um, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers. Uh, he is Professor Paul Newman. He's project leader of the Mobile Robotics Group at the Department of Engineering Science at Oxford University. Um, the team is developing a self-driving car that interprets data from sensors so it can see its surroundings and negotiate them safely. So please welcome Paul Newman. Thank you very much. I think I, think I was always going to do this. I was never the guy that built the thing that the Lego box said you should build. Okay, I was always messing around. I was always going to be an engineer. And then something happened in my latter days at Oxford as an undergraduate, and I realized it wasn't about the device at all. It was a bit dull. It was about computing. There's something extraordinary about the job that I have as professor of information engineering, and that's that we create a text file that allows machines to understand and move in their world. And I expect never to lose that excitement. And I get a chance tonight to spend now four minutes, 34 seconds, telling you about what we're doing with that on transport. It's not that I am a transport guy. I'm not a petrol head at all. I'm interested in robotics. And it's robotics and information engineering that is going to change transport, have no doubt. So I'm going to talk about robot cars. What a great name, huh? So, you know, the why, the what, the when, and the how I'm going to cover very, very quickly. If you don't believe this, you need to leave. 
Okay? This is, I'm going to argue this by assertion. That always works, I find, with undergraduates. This has to be a true thing. I think to believe that we will be condemned to the kind of cars that we have now for all time is insane. Okay? It is much harder to believe that we will forever driving than never driving. That's, I think that's a, that's a bit of a truism. So, you know, why do we want that? Why might we want cars to do some of the driving for us? Well, because you've all got 24 hours a day. Sorry, that's just fixed. Okay? You just have 24 hours a day, and we pack more into our lives. So why should you be slave to that car in a traffic jam? Efficiency. We're terrible at driving. You kind of kill and maim and pollute. I'm sorry, but you do when you drive. You've got to stop doing that. And the cars are going to help. And of course, the one we always talk about is safety. Yes, that's great. You know, we want to do less maiming. And I think machines are better at doing stuff than humans, because if they weren't, we wouldn't have machines. That's why we make them. OK, and why would cars be any different? They're going to get better. So the what, let's talk about the what about these driving. So what might a self-driving car need? Well, really important point. Don't ask anyone to build anything for you. Okay? Let's not change the roads in any way because we've spent our money on infrastructure. We built the roads. We took large parts of the country, we tarmacked it, we painted it, and we put a lot of laws down about what you're allowed to do, and we built cities around it. That's enough infrastructure. Do nothing else. So the cars must be self-reliant. They've got to use onboard computing to understand the world, and that's what we're working on. Not reliant. Reliant. Have it if you want it, but not reliant on external infra uh, infrastructure like GPS, which requires space rockets and can be turned off. It doesn't seem that smart, and it doesn't work so well in tunnels. We shouldn't be reliant on anybody else. So we've got to be self-sufficient. I also don't think we're going to be buying cars that have a fixed competency. Like most devices in the future, they will be learning from you. They'll learn how you like to drive. They'll drive like you. They'll like learn to drive like the culture in which you're embedded. And they will get better collectively over time because data on how you're driving, what all the other cars are doing will be shared. And they'll learn and they'll get better. And that's going to be great. They're going to have huge memories, which is free. Okay, that's an important point. If you think ahead, communications, memory, and computing is going to be done for the transport sector by other sectors of humanity. That's just going to happen, and they are going to leverage it. So when? Important line. I think the cars are going to drive some of the people, some of the time, in some of the places, and it's going to start like that. I don't see a Tuesday or a Wednesday coming along where there's a car that does, you don't need a steering wheel anytime soon. What will happen is the cars will offer you autonomy. They'll say, if you like, in this traffic jam, you press this button now that's gone green because you're being offered autonomy. I will drive you these two kilometers, and your insurance has gone down by 9p because I bid for you in real time. And you go, yeah, I am a bit tired, and it is raining. I take your offer up. And if it's snowing, it might not work because the conditions aren't right. But the car knows. The car knows what's safe, and it knows what it can do. It's watching you drive, and it's rehearsing behind the scenes. If I was driving, I'd be doing this. Yep, I agree. I could offer you autonomy, and the insurance will be real time. It's not you're going to phone direct line and say, insure my self-driving car for the year, please. I think that's unlikely. The car will be saying, insure me now for this stretch of road. So how might we do it? Well, we've got an example car up at Oxford, the robot car, and we're a robotics group. And this is what drives us. We're not condemned to a future of congestion, accidents, and time wasting. We're not, and robotic science is going to fix it. it really, is. it's the roboticists that are going to do this. Um, so here you go. Here's what I'm going to, I could talk for three hours at this point, but I've got, probably got two minutes, I believe. I'm going to, 30 seconds, he says, here, really? Here is a way to do this. So first of all, the car goes through, and it memorizes the world. So it's driven by a human at some point through the world, and it memorizes the world. It builds a map of the world. This is horse guards. We drove through London one morning, and it builds a nice map of the world. And then at runtime, when the car goes out with a cheap camera, it has that a memory. It has a memory of all the places that all cars have ever been driven. And then cheaply, with a camera, it can say, well, I've been close to this place before. Am I a bit to the left? Does the view look right? Am I a bit to the right? Oh, if I'm here, that looks just right. I'm replaying my memory, and the car can remember where it is. And it can do this without needing any GPS whatsoever. And if you've got GPS, that's great. 
But what we want to do is have an arms race with the car companies. The cars are independently smart. They know where they are on the road without needing any GPS, without needing any fancy traffic lights with radio signals, and you especially don't need any built highways because we've already built the roads. How daft would it be to say that? We just want to have an extra. Oh, I want the extra air conditioning when I'm buying my new car. I'd like the extra lumber support and autonomy, please. And it'll be an option that you put in. And that autonomy ticket will get cheaper and more extended over time. So we will teach the cars to drive ourselves. Be like, we'll be teaching all computers to get better. There won't be a fixed competency. And they'll share the lessons collectively over all people that are driving. And like all robots, they'll get better as we use them. These have to be true things because it's not just going to be transport. All the computing that we use will become personalized and better through use. So the machines are coming, and they're going to drive us if you want and if you're ready. Thank you. Stay here. Stay. Paul, that was fantastic. What, was I the only person who, when you said a self-driving car that drives just like you, am I the only person who thought of my partner and a, a bit of terror ran through me? Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm sure she feels the same way because about she me. Drives like you. Yes, exactly. So, um, right, questions. Uh, quick questions. Ah, very good. There's somebody here. Tell us your name, I'm and you got. James. Oh, well, just oh, no. Wait for the mic. Yeah. Uh, Gareth James. There may be more and more cars on the roads, but as we know, more and more people are living in cities. Is there really a role for a car at all? Maybe we should be ignoring cars and looking at other forms of moving people around rather than a car, whether it's automated or not. Yeah. Hold that, hold that thought. Okay, where's the next one? Yep, go. Ah. Just one word, potholes. Potholes. <laughs> there we are. Uh, <laughs> yes. Potholes, you're getting a car. Um, okay, and then there's a, a woman back there, I think. Yeah, very good. Okay, we'll just take the, oh, where's he gone? We'll just take these three. Uh, hello. Uh, I believe that we will have self-driving cars. When, when does this happen? Okay. Right. Do you want to know when you can actually buy one? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so when can the lady buy one? Mm -hmm. Potholes. And why do we need cars anyway? And hang on. Okay. So when... Choose a car. Okay. Let me take them in reverse order if I can. When will you buy them? There won't be a sudden launch where there was a Tuesday where there was no self-driving car and a Wednesday where there was. It's going to come in slowly. So some cars at the moment, the focus can reverse itself and park. You should look at the new S-Class Mercedes, the kind of competencies that that has. What we're going to have, the cars are just going to get better. They'll drive more of the people, more of the time, in more of the places. This is going to be graded as it gets safer, as you get certification. It's not going to be a sudden market launch of no need for a steering wheel. You're starting to see it now, and it's never going to stop. Potholes, yes, but why can't the car see it? It's dis so that's okay. Yeah, so you can see cars. In fact, many cars will be driving with all the cameras. After 2015, every car in the States has to be fitted with a camera. Why can't those cars just be looking for the potholes and say there's potholes here? Why can't the highways agency on, or on every dust cart have a machine that goes through? In fact, we're doing this, a little parasitic device that goes and maps the roads day after day after day, and you can see the potholes coming. Why do we need cars in cities? Maybe we don't, but technology provides options. It doesn't ever force something on you. If you don't want to buy a car, don't buy a car. But if you do want a car with air conditioning, buy one with air conditioning. If you're getting old and your eyesight's failing over time, sorry, I'm not saying you are, but <laughs> <laughs> things that go wrong quickly, um, then you should have that as an option. Technology is all about options. You might want to buy yourself a green car, knock yourself out. You might want to buy a car that makes you less tired, make yourself knock yourself out. It's a text file that you can select on a tick box and say, yeah, I do want a better car. And it's information engineering that does it. You know what? I think if you ever became a used self-driving car salesman, <laughs> uh, I think you do very, very well. Let's hear it for Paul Newman. Okay, so we've established the rule, which is that if you ask an incredibly short question, you get a prize car. Um, so, uh, our next speaker, uh, who has flown here all the way from Boston, Robin Chase, founder and CEO of Buzzcar, a service that brings together car owners and drivers in a car-sharing marketplace. She's also founder and former CEO of Zipcar. You've heard of Zipcar, of course, the largest car-sharing company in the world, and Go Loco, an online ride-sharing community. Please welcome Robin Chase. Robin Chase. 
So when I think about smarter mobility, I really am thinking about the future of mobility. And the future of mobility, if I had my druthers on the five minutes, I would tell you that the future is going to be urban. We know that 50% today and going to 80% by 2050 are going to be urban. It's therefore going to be multimodal because we can't fit the number of people and cars as we have in cities today. And if we think of Manhattan as a very dense Western city, it is in the density of cities, it is not even in the top 50% of dense cities. And in Manhattan, only 50% of the households own cars. So we're going to be going to a place where 10% of the households own cars. It's faster, quicker, cheaper. It will be multimodal because you'll be using the car that you want for the, each particular trip, just like in the morning when you wake up. How am I going to, you know, am I going to cook myself? Am I going to eat it? Am I going to eat it prepared? You'll have this whole suite, and that is going to be the future, that I'll be choosing many, many different modes. And the vehicles, when they exist, will be shared ones. And we know that because, as we saw with Zipcar, that instead of each person owning their own car, we have one car that's shared by 50 people. 20 of those people were going to own their own car, and because of a share, access to a shared car, they no longer own it. So it reduces dramatically the number of shared cars. In the future, there will be all shared cars, is my view. Um, definitely in the cities. And uh, we'll see later, I think, elsewhere as well. So since I'm supposed to talk about cars, I don't think the future has a very small place for the cars. So what's really interesting that's happening in the car mobility sector is that there's a new um, organizational structure that partners institutions and big companies that build a platform for participation and then asks peers and individuals to be co-investors in that business model. So if we think about Zipcar owned and operated its own cars, and that meant that Zipcar would only put cars in places where you get a return on investment, and I would never put a car where I wasn't insured of getting that, I started this company, Buzzcar, in France, where individuals are renting out their own vehicles. And I think of this as tapping into excess capacity. And so because it's people's own cars, they've already bought that asset for themselves. If they rent their car one time a year, excellent. If they rent it once a month, better. And if they rent it three times a day, fabulous. But because of that, that co-invest, this co-partnership co that I think of as Peers Incorporated, we now, after two years in France, have 7,000 cars across the country to be rented. And we can have transactions happen in places where you would never have a car rental company and never have a, a car sharing company because you couldn't get the return on investment. So this is happening in many, many different places. Um, the largest ride sharing company in the world, again, excess capacity. I'm going from one place to another far away, and I have my three empty seats. It's called Blah Blah Car. They move um, the equivalent. Three million people, I think, every year. Um, they move the equivalent of 2,500 high-speed trains every month, but they didn't buy a train car or lay a track. This is how we're moving people in the future. Um, Sidecar and Lyft, these are two companies that are startups in um, San Francisco, and they are, you drive your own car as a taxi as if you are a taxi. So again, we're not buying any new taxi cars, and these cars, it's just like driving your own taxi. Um, another Uber is the same concept, but um, they're doing it two different ways. One, if you're an owner of a black car or of a taxi, if you have that kind of driver's license through the app, they take out the middleman, so it's a faster connection. Again, the company invests in the platform, and it's others who are co-investing. Um, another example to go to the developing world, this is called G Auto, and it's in India. They, the platform is that they created a, they do bulk buying of diesel fuel, they create standards of um, etiquette for drivers, they pay for school fees and health insurance, and independent auto rickshaw drivers join that company that's done all of those things for them, and again, they've created this bigger platform. Um, so if, as I explained, this was the future of mobility, and I think this is really happening, um, I want to close with the thought that once you introduce self-driving vehicles, and I'm talking about fully autonomous, this whole world of transportation is actually flipped onto its head. The reason why people, um, many of us take public transportation, because it's the fastest, cheapest, best way, and the reason we don't take our own car is because I can't park, because it's expensive, because I'm going to get stuck in traffic. And the, but there's people who are refusing to go there, They're refusing to give up their cars because they won't participate in public transportation. Once we have the autonomous car, there's two possible scenarios for it, as I see. One is privately owned, 
in which case we are talking about transportation hell because we will have zero occupancy vehicles that are driving around. I'm going to nip into the store, please circle the block 25 times until I bought it. Or worse, I want that pizza, I'm going to send the car and then someone will run out and hand it. Go pick up my laundry for me. That we will have zero occupancy vehicles everywhere congesting the city. So I see that future for the autonomous car. Hell, we need to have taxes and we need to have strong, strong regulations to make that not happen. Conversely, we have future transportation paradise, which is they become public shared vehicles. And now I will, I never wanted to get in the subway because it was too crowded or I'm two miles from the closest tube station. We will be able to have door to door, which is the end all for transportation. Very few people in that vehicle, door to door, real time, on demand. And those cars will be always moving, they won't be parked. And uh, if you want to share the ride, you'll be six people in a car and it'll be cheap. And if you are an expensive, fancy person, you'll say, I want the whole thing for myself and I want a Mercedes. But both of these will dramatically reduce the number of cars, the number of parked cars, and the people who are taking public transportation. That's everything. Thank you, Robin. Robin. <laughs> Fantastic. I love the idea of the car. Get me a pizza. Um, <laughs> Right, so, oh, there's already a hand right up there. It's the, the, the little cars, you see. They want the little cars. And there's another one down below. Is there? Ah, very good, yeah. Thank you. My name's Alex Shea. Uh, firstly, let me say I'm a great fan of Zipcar. I have a membership myself, so I'm all for that. But if you really do reduce the number of cars by a factor of 50, aren't you going to be the biggest enemy of the automobile companies? I know Ford, I think, are already an investor in... Is it Zipcar? Or okay. one, one of the car sharing. So perhaps they're taking a quite proactive view on that. But in the long term, if they see their sales dropping by 50 times, you'll get taken what out. Gonna do? They'll put a contract out on you if they think you're going to succeed. <laughs> right, OK, there's somebody here. No. Here comes, comes Mike. Here comes Mike. And then I'm going to take this person right at the back there because they're waving so much. Yeah. I was just wondering how you see the use of policies which drive down car use in the inner cities. And how's that? How's the synergy with, you know, things like buzz car and car use? So, I mean, if you're going to reduce parking in cities and that kind of side of things, I'm, I'm interested to hear how that might operate. Okay, and then finally, uh, how will the uh, car sharing change the actual design of a car? Oh, <laughs> you're getting the car. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, are you going to be taken out by the, uh, yeah. the automobile manufacturers? Uh, what's the relationship between this and kind of overall yeah. car use? Uh, and what about design? So when I started Zipcar, I did honestly have an image in my head of the uh, godfather scene when people are going to be dashing into my bedroom with machine guns and kill me dead. Um, but now the car industry, through no fault of my own or through fault of my own, have actually seen the writing on the wall. Every single major car manufacturer has a car sharing or peer to a car sharing company in action. And this is definitively the writing on the wall, and they're all scared to death, and they're working as hard as they can to come up with a new business model for the next 20 to transition to. So I have, it's, it's done, it's gonna happen. Um, the question about what does it mean for my business model, we have this period of trans transformation, and like any company, we're, we've stepped in to enable this transformation, and we're always gonna have to stay on the front edge, and if it's not gonna be cars, it'll be something else. But them's the brakes. Today, it's a huge market. It will be there, and then as it fades into an autonomous car has come, that'll be something. We'll be providing the software on top. Um, and then the last question about this, which kind of cars to design, I'm always intrigued, and I love this question because I've been asked by car manufacturers, what kind of car should we design? There's three points. Point number one, we have to disaggregate ownership from access to the car. And this has been a huge challenge for Zipcar. We had to build our own. How do you let people to get in when they're authorized? So that they have to do that. Two, they have to have built-in car seats so that you can um, up or down the, for baby seats. That's a really big challenge. And three, absolutely positively, there is no one kind of car. The whole joy of having your own car, of car sharing, is that I choose the car specific to that exact trip. Do I need a pickup truck for an hour and a half? Do I need a minivan for the weekend? Am I trying to impress my boss? Let's get the BMW. I mean, whatever it is, it is 
profoundly not one car, and you think in that way when you think you had to buy one, and when you use it by the hour and by the day, it's very trip-specific. So I'd buy a car off Paul, and I would definitely invest in any company that Robin set up. <laughs> Robin Chase. Thank you. Okay, so now we're really going to take off, because our third speaker is Jerry Sanders, who's CEO of Skytran, a NASA Space Act company which is working to pilot a rapid trans... We say pilot, I think that means pilot as an experiment, rather than pilot as in <laughs> pilot, doesn't it? But to pilot a rapid transit system in Tel Aviv, a network of elevated guideways transports people at high speeds above the city using small computer-controlled magnetically levitated... It's unbelievable, Jerry. Thank you, thank you. It is unbelievable. Uh, soon it will be believable, thank you. Some people see things that are and ask why. Some people dream of things that never were and ask why not. And some people have to commute to work and don't have time for any of that. We call those people Skytran customers. My name is Jerry Sanders. I am the Skytran's uh, chairman and CEO. And thank you, Intelligence Squared organizers, for inviting me, allowing me to address you this evening. It's an honor to be in this august company. Indeed, I even managed to persuade my daughter to join me by promising her that there would be movie stars here. Thank you, Paul Newman. <laughs> Several years ago, I was approached by a NASA software and biotech engineer, Dr. Robert Birch. Bob asked me whether I could have an interest to take on the management of a public transportation company. Well, I was doing my best to beat a hasty retreat from this mad scientist who in Silicon Valley, famous home of the Tesla and the Testarossa, trying to interest me in public transportation, Bob opened his laptop and showed me images of the Skytran system. Bob hooked me then, and I'm here to hook you now. Indeed, I'm here to show you how we can go from not moving in traffic to moving at speeds of 100 to 200 kilometers an hour above traffic. And I'm here to explain that we can do so without stopping anywhere along the way, unless it's somewhere that we, in fact, wish to stop. But first, a word from our sponsor, Congestion. <laughs> congestion, being stuck in traffic, is one of the most soul-crushing, stress-inducing, irritating, time-wasting things that we as a society impose upon ourselves. And with great respect to my colleagues, whether you're in a shared car, private car, electric car, computerized self-driven car, every vehicle sits in traffic, all vehicles add to traffic, and all vehicles cause pollution. Yet worldwide, anyone who can avoid public transportation avoids public transportation. Why? Because public transportation is even worse than traffic. Buses, just like cars, are stuck in surface traffic. They attempt to follow, and usually don't, a rigid schedule. They're crowded during rush hours, the time when you need them the most. Subways, your underground, moves below the traffic, but it is certainly not private, and it takes a long time and a lot of money to build. How much time and how much money? Well, one mile of New York City's Lexington Avenue line was over 10 years in the making and cost $2 billion a mile. Let's see just how bad it is. This is an illustration of traffic worldwide. I didn't choose just bad cities, I chose all cities. Hope is on the way. Enter Skytran, elevated, high-speed, low-cost, silent and unobtrusive, green, personal, rapid transportation. Elevated, Skytran flies above all surface traffic. Flies, yes, it flies. Skytran is a unique velocity-based adaptation of passive, passive magnetic levitation. To the uninitiated, that means that Skytran vehicles literally surf on a self-generated magnetic wave using a magnetic surfboard, if you will. And they do so without generating harmful magnetic emissions. High speeds, how does 250 kilometers an hour grab you? Skytran is the only system of its kind that can connect the urban to the suburban to the exurban. Unobtrusive, Skytran's guideways rest on an 18-inch diameter standard steel pole. That means that it does not require a lane in the highway, a dedicated sidewalk, or an expensive concrete structure of its own. 
Low cost, SkyTran is made in factories like Lego blocks and shipped to the site. SkyTran's infrastructure costs are an order of magnitude less than the cost of bespoke tailored light rail systems. How much less? About one-tenth to one-twentieth less. Compare over $100 million a kilometer for light rail to less than $3 million a kilometer for SkyTran. Silent, as in... SkyTran rides on a cushion of air. No rail on rail, no rubber on the road. So quiet, we may have to put bells and whistles on it just to let you know it's there. SkyTran is green. Its vehicles use less than half the energy of a hybrid car, and SkyTran returns energy directly into the grid without resorting to inefficient batteries. And personal, just get in and go. No waiting on bus or train schedules. No stopping at other people's stations. No intrusive commuters reading your emails. In short, there is no faster, more efficient, or less expensive way to reduce congestion and pollution than SkyTran. So when can you see it and where can you ride it? Well, our pilot system, what we call our show and tell system, will be built within a year to 14 months at NASA and or at Israel Aerospace Industries. We're finalizing the details on that. Now, our first commercial projects are already approved for Tel Aviv Israel and Netanya Israel, and we reasonably expect those to be up and running commercially within three to four years most of which time will be devoted to addressing government regulations. And we also have a large project nearing approval in Kotayam, Kerala, India. In fact, I'm flying there tomorrow for further discussions. And of course, we hope that eventually the innovators in Silicon Valley and Mountain View, our hometown, will come to accept that public transportation can be sexy too. After all, look at me. Jerry, that was awesome. There's already a hand up here. Usually these are people who want to come work for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Michael Hammond. I'm just intrigued at what's the, uh, the, the passenger capacity of one of the units, and you know, presumably that's one of the restrictions. Yeah, yeah. One... Well, wait, wait, wait. wait. Okay. Hold that passenger capacity per unit. There's a gentleman there. So, yeah, my name's Tony Wormsley. Uh, I'd catch one tonight if I could. Uh, what's the single biggest obstacle to developing it? Biggest obstacle? I'm desperate for a woman. Uh -huh. uh, oh, not a woman. Okay, all right. Can you do, can you do it in a kind of higher pitch? I can do voice? a high pitch. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, just wanted to know about the um, energy in and out of the system compared to an electric car, please. Right. Energy in and out of the system compared to electric car. Uh, how many people fit in it? And then there was a second question. Which I... Sure. Barriers. Oh, yeah, the barriers. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so one um, SkyTran guideway, one line of SkyTran can carry the equivalent of three freeway lanes. That means we can move about 11,000 to 12,000 people per hour per guideway line. And that means that the more guideway lines we build, we go up geometrically on that. Um, the second question was? Uh, the, the barriers. Barriers, okay, so I'm going to share with you my favorite Groucho Marx quote. Politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. Our greatest barrier is government... Our greatest barrier is government regulation. Um, governments uh, have a very hard time understanding what SkyTran is and how it works, and so we find ourselves spending huge amounts of time debating in the departments of transportation whether this is an airplane or a vehicle. And you would be surprised how much time and effort and money is wasted on that one question before we even get to build. And the next uh, question uh, And then the uh, final question was energy emissions compared to oh, electric Oh, energy. Car. So, um, okay, I'll share another anecdote. When I joined the company several years ago, I was sitting down with these bunch of NASA engineers, all very smart people, obviously, and they're explaining to me how they've got this great system and, um, and they use a power converter to take um, alternating current, co convert it to high voltage direct current, and then convert it back to alternating current. And I said, well, how do you do that? I say, oh, it's just the power converter sits in, inside the guideway. And I said, well, where's the power converter? And they point to this refrigerator-sized thing, 
And they said, that's the power converter. And I said, well, how's that going to work? So um, we've managed to shrink that thing down to the size of a laptop computer. It sits in the guideway. It takes alternating current, transforms it to high voltage direct current, and moves it back to alternating current. So we actually feed the grid with electricity. And each one of our vehicles uses a third of the energy of a hybrid car. Very good. Now, Jerry, this is a critical moment. I, I, I'm going to either inspire you or depress you. I want everyone in the room who thinks they will see a Skytrans somewhere in the UK uh, during their lifetime to put your hand up now. Mm, not bad, not bad. Uh, and all those people who think it, it's never going to happen. Uh, okay, that's not just because they're all old, to be honest. Um, uh, okay, Jerry Sanders. Thank you. Okay, so now for something completely different. Uh, we've, we've got, we're going from high tech, I think it's fair to say, to low tech. We're going from technology to people. Uh, we're going to hear from Ben Hamilton Bailey, urban designer, leading international expert on shared space, the low tech, a low tech solution to city congestion, where counterintuitively, it's a beautiful, I love that word, counterintuitively, road safety and vehicle flows are improved by removing street furniture and traffic controls. He's the founder and director of Hamilton Bailey Associates Limited. Please welcome Ben Hamilton Bailey. <coughs> this is going to really bring you down after such high tech. This is, I'm uh, very, very dull by comparison. My job is merely to beat up traffic engineers and to try and find uh, uh, simpler uh, ways of uh, creating civility. Because I wanted to uh, start by saying that when we talk about smarter mobility, we need to keep our eye on what is it all about. Because transport, for what, how wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, technology and business models and so on you've seen, we just remember that actually transport itself isn't a good. We don't desire it for its own sake, or well, a few people do, Jeremy Clarkson and so on. Generally, it's a way of achieving uh, either greater uh, uh, economic exchanges or more social exchanges, i.e. money and sex, which is the things that we, we really, really want. So that, so that we, it's important to keep our, keep our uh, a mind focused on whether these solutions give us more money and sex. Now, because ultimately, what we're, we're hoping to achieve uh, successful societies, civility, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and be able to, to distribute and equalize greater wealth. <clears throat> now, many people, most of my life I've been uh, trying to find ways to reduce speeds in cities because uh, slower speeds give you greater efficiencies in cities. And a lot of people talk about in how, in, you know, so don't worry about it because in, in car robots are going to come along and sort the problem. But I've always been rather doubtful about the potential for uh, allowing uh, in car robots to take control of our, of our lives. And I wanted to, to really talk about the fact that we often can lose track of what we're doing in the first place. Perhaps this is an unkind cartoon, but an awful lot of places start becoming non places because they're led over by engineers, adding more and more things and signs and barriers and so on, no doubt to solve good problems, but creating no places at all. And if it is an unkind cartoon, this is the approach into uh, London from Kew Bridge, a hugely expensive amounts of kit and technology involved on assumptions about the need to organize the movement through that space. Now, uh, just one example of where this, uh, our, our, we've been involved in, in, in uh, street design, thinking about what a street should be, the things that make up the huge proportion of our, both our highway infrastructure, our street infrastructure, our, our movement infrastructure, and also the important places. Exhibition Road in West London, for those of you who don't know it, links all the great museums together. Until a few years ago, it was a pretty a miserable street itself. No one really bothered about that. Uh, it's now been transformed into a, a street which still serves the 9,000 vehicles or so that move up and down it at low speeds, but it's also become a very different sort of street. Incidentally, when we're working on this, I think this is a street that challenges our relationship between government and cities and people. Because when we were working on this, the Department for Transport, as you, as you, you find out, uh, very worried about the regulation. What sort of a street is it? How are we going to sign this to people to tell them how to move through it? And the cartoonist in the time picked up on the idea, and I thought it a very useful sign <laughs> to, 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 to suggest it. But it is, it is the case that for a long time, we've been puzzled about the relationship between transport and public space. I'm old enough to have been at school when the Department for Transport, or MOT as it was then, Ministry of Transport, sent to every school this leaflet 
about road safety, uh, a notion that, that really children or people should not be involved in the space between buildings, it should be for cars. And this is the poster that really got me interested in this subject. This came out in 1981, an extremely successful safety campaign, Saatchi and Saatchi designed for the Department for Transport, which posited this notion that really the boundary between the carriageway and the street is extremely dangerous. I mean, even the Americans don't kill people for making mistakes like this. It seemed to be a very odd image. So I've been looking for ways in which we can, we can rethink the nature of the space between buildings. And it's an odd one when you think about it. We know, we, we've realized in the last 30, 40 years how important our buildings are to the quality of, of life and society. And I want you to imagine some nice building here in London, some uh, great building like this one, or, or, or a library, a town hall, and some vandal, some hoodie comes along uh, in the middle of the night and he sprays paint all over there to do that. And the little shit's dragged off to, uh, to the cells, but not before he's badly damaged that building. And the citizens wake up next morning to find that a nice building, much outrage and, and, and concern, the press rush in and so on. Fortunately, it being, this being the city of London, they're extremely quick and efficient with uh, clearing up and cleaning up the damage and carrying on the business of responsible government as usual. <laughs> there is an odd schism between the way we treat one half of our, public's, uh, our built environment and another one. I want to touch on the work of this man, uh, sadly no longer with us, but he's a traffic engineer, you can tell by his tie. But he began to <laughs> rethink the nature of what, how you can use cars more successfully in the villages and towns of his native Friesland. And I was fortunate enough to work with him for many years and to stand on his great shoulders. And he began to take traffic signals out at busy junctions. This was one of his in his hometown of Drachten where he uh, handling a, a vehicle, a junction handling 17,000 vehicles a day, very busy indeed, where counterintuitively the removal of the uh, signal, uh, the, 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 the controls, allowed the junction to become much more efficient because, as he always says, people aren't stupid. If you start to do thinking for people, they become stupid. Just don't let people be stupid. So we've just recently applied uh, to, to uh, solving the problem of a small town in uh, Cheshire, Poynton, a uh, place just south of Manchester, kind of footballer's wives' country. Uh, but it, poor point in the crossroads town has 26,000 vehicles a day going through it, a lot of them HGVs. The middle of point in, as a result, was completely destroyed, and the purpose of that little town was dying because nobody wanted to come into point in when the middle of the, of the town looked like this. So what we posited was uh, taking, uh, to, our, to our amazement of the traffic engineers, taking out the signals uh, and everything else, every other trace of highway on the middle of this town, and allowing, uh, reducing speeds through various tricks, uh, killing the driver's uh, psychology, and allowing uh, drivers to make up their own minds. And I'm glad to say that the congestion has vanished. In the 20 months it's been operational, we have, we've had one bruised knee so far. Um, but the important thing is that uh, money and sex, that many, many more people are coming into this uh, small town. But I, I, as, 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 a, as a boring traffic um, uh, nerd like me, I love seeing it at higher speeds because you realize how remarkably intelligent uh, drivers can be simply given the right, right cues. So I think coming back to the question of what, is, uh, what, what a place is about, well, it's about that quality of the church, the, the memory of, of buildings, and the ability to move around uh, uh, simply and safely and interact with drivers uh, rather than have them uh, sort of hidden behind the technology of, of the automobiles. So I want to just finish with the image for me what uh, smarter mobility really means. It's uh, an image of a place near here, um, Seven Dials in uh, St. Giles near Covent Garden. And this is, a, as the name suggests, a junction which is very complicated. Seven streets converge. And 25 years ago, uh, the, new, the monument, the uh, sundial, was placed in the middle. It still handles quite a lot of traffic and people. Um, there's always beautiful women sitting on the podium because it's a wonderful place to display your clothes and so on. But the thing about it, like it, if you haven't seen, haven't been there before, is that it, it's, it's about life. It's not about itself about transport, although it functions extremely well as a junction. It has the lowest congestion rate and the best safety record. Of, of all of, of Camden's junctions. But it, to me, epitomizes this notion, we call it shared space, of the idea of, um, of simply the government setting back and allowing people to be people. And that includes drivers who, in, in the case of Seven Dials, become extremely hyper-aware of an anticipation of the circumstances and people around them. Does anybody here remember Faulty Towers? 
You know, old enough? Do you remember the major in Fulton Towers? Well, he's, here he comes now. He's about 20 years older. But like, like most, uh, most people, he can have an odd senior moment and completely forget what it was he came out for in the first place. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because something about that space allows the communication, a human communication, between the taxi driver and, and the old man, uh, which to me is actually what smart mobility is about. Thank you very much. Okay, while we figure around with your, uh, your, your mic, we'll take three questions, and I'm going to take the gentleman there with the kind of lighter grey sleeve to his top. Yeah, that's it. Ah. Uh, Ian MacDonald. I think there are two factors that have been omitted slightly. One is it's taken us centuries to develop the car, and the love relationship that we have with the car is enormous. And we've got huge governments, and they basically exist in order to regulate so things that you're describing seem not to fit very well with those two rather fundamental psychological factors. Okay, hold on to that point. Who's next? Yep, there's a lady here. And a nice sparkly scarf. Hi. Does, it, does, does the concept of open space, which I love the idea of, but I know when I was in Exhibition Road, I was with, with lots of children, and it, we were just, we were really confused whether it was a pedestrian area, whether it, where the cars were supposed to be there, where we should park. Does, does open space like that increase the anxiety and stress potentially? Brilliant. Okay, that's winning on the car front at the moment. Uh, but maybe the third question will trump you. Okay, uh, yes, so there's, a, there's another idea. Can you reach across the... Oh, nicely done. Okay. In fact, 90% of a car's time is spent stationary. Um, what d does this solution do for that? Oh, interesting. Okay, so stationary cars, does it include or reduce your anxiety? And what are you going to do about the military industrial complex? And <laughs> you can share that with one of your children. No, no, very, good, very good question there. I guess the re reverse order. The, 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 um, the reason why point and works and the congestion has vanished is because. Uh, our journey times are determined by the efficiency of junctions, not by the speed that we move between junctions. And junctions work much better at lower speeds than at higher speeds. We design streets at, for 35 miles an hour with a 30 mile an hour speed limit, merely on the whim of uh, Dr. Hall Belisha, the Minister for Transport in 1934, who found it was the minimum speed that his then three-geared Humber car would stay, stay in gear and not stall. It's a hopeless <laughs> speed for cities. So a continuous slow movement gives you much greater efficiency of, of movement. Now, there's some other really good questions here, and of course, my anxiety brain, does it reduce or uh, it, Well, that's an extremely good question. That's why you got um, the car. Absolutely. Um, it, it, the answer is, if it didn't, if you didn't feel less safe, I would be very worried. I would have failed. If you're interacting and moving amongst half-ton uh, lumps of metal moving around, you should feel a little unsafe, and your children should learn be pretty wary of these things. So I'm very encouraged when people say, I don't feel comfortable or safe in these surroundings because that's a good thing. It's good for your safety. And, and I'm very, so I'm very glad that you're less comfortable. But in terms of the, the, the um, uh, military-industrial military complex. Industrial complex, I can only say that, that the late Hans Mondermann said to me early on, Ben, never fight against cars. They're far too powerful. Work with them because they are so embedded into our... Uh, economy and culture, that you will exhaust yourself swimming against the tide, that, that if you want to find solutions, you have to work with what you have, uh, what the technology will provide, uh, but also work with what, who, who we are as humans, to understand how our brains work and the social uh, um, motives that, that we have as, a, as, a, as an intelligent social creature. Ben Hamilton Bailey. Okay, so what's going to happen now, almost seamlessly, is a set of chairs are going to come in behind me and we're going to bring the panel up and David Rowan is going to try to knit all this together. As it's happening, I've been thinking of something to do with you. There are two moments of audience participation, I noticed, in that session, and this leads me to a really big question. Uh, you, you kind of went, ooh, when you saw the congestion, but also someone mentioned Jeremy Clarkson, there was a little frisson. So I'm going to ask you to choose what's worse, congestion or Jeremy Clarkson, okay? So have a little think about it, um, okay? Uh, we're nearly there. All right, all those who think congestion is worse than Jeremy Clarkson, put your hands up. And all those who think Jeremy Clarkson's worse than congestion. 
Oh, I don't know. It's quite close. Quite. I wish it would have been slightly more definitive, that. Okay. Um, right, panel, do you want to come and... <laughs> That's very good. Yes, very good. Okay. I, I've got an image of thousands of Jeremy Clarksons ramming up against each other. Okay. Uh, pa panel, come and, uh, come and take a seat. Come and take a seat. Okay, so now we're going to be hearing from uh, David Rowan, who's editor of the UK edition of Wired magazine. He also writes for the Digital Life column of GQ magazine and the Tech Traveller column in Condé Nast Traveller. Uh, he has this, your task, you know when you're on a road and you're on the outside lane and you've, you've forgotten that your turning is just about to happen and you've got to somehow weave through all those lanes in order to get off without causing an accident. Your task is as hard as that, to weave all this together. I've got a but jet it's up back, to you. it's okay. It's up to you. Over um, to you. Give him a, hand of a, a round of applause. You don't know what I'm going to say yet. No, no, no. We're applauding you for even trying, David. It's hard to follow some of these yeah. rather clever people. Um, so it's 1983, and you are the CEO of AT&T. And AT&T provides an awful lot of landlines to consumers' homes across America. And then this new gadget hits the market. It's kind of this big. And if you're really careful, and you've got batteries that are charged up, you can make a mobile telephone call with it. And you get early celebrity endorsers like you know, Mikhail Gorbachev will be seen publicly using the mobile telephone. And you start to get a bit worried because you think, hang on, we have copper cables going to hundreds of millions of homes and this thing may challenge our business model. So what do you do? You call in McKinsey. You call in you know, the most expensive smart kids in the world, and you write them a very big check, and they go off for a few months, and they do some calculations. And you say to them, um, just give us a really informed view of, by the end of the 20th century, and 17 years from now, how many of these mobile telephones do you think there'll be in America? And McKinsey comes back, and it's pretty certain it's got the best due diligence it could buy. And it says, well, we think there could be as many as 900,000 mobile telephones in America <laughs> by the end of the 20th century. Um, which wasn't a bad first guess, except there were 109 million. And I think we can learn three things from where they went wrong. First of all, all of us tend to frame our projections for the future based on our own personal experience and we take our own personal histories and what we're used to doing. And technology moves in very different directions, and it also moves incredibly fast. And it's very difficult for us to see how our comfortable routines will be challenged by new things. And that does happen a lot. If you think, just if I'd come in here three years ago, and I'd have said, you'll be able to talk to this phone, and it will be able to answer back with a voice, and then Siri comes along, and you get into a bit of a habit. You think you can do it. Um, the second thing that McKinsey didn't really put into consideration enough was this thing called Moore's Law, which is that computer processing power, pretty much through the last century, has continued to double every year and a half, year. And that's still continuing. And there's something extraordinary about exponential growth when things keep doubling. Um, just around the corner from where Jerry is based on the NASA Ames Research Center is a place called Singularity University where they try and prepare people to think for these exponential opportunities and also exponential threats to their businesses. And the simple way to look at it is in, an, in a linear world where things are increasing, one plus one is two, plus one is three, by the 30th step you get to the number 30. Um, but in an exponential world where you're doubling the whole time, one, two, four, eight, by the 30th step, you get to more than a billion. And we're on that path. We don't yet know which bit of that hockey stick we're at when it comes to transportation technologies. But you have to expect that what we can get from robotics, from artificial intelligence, from other forms of networked computing, is just going to be so radically different just in two, four, five years. Um, and I think the third thing that 
McKinsey didn't notice, was it's not about technology. It's about people and how they adapt technology because it enhances their lives. It gets rid of the friction points. It helps them express themselves emotionally. And that's what the mobile phone does. You know, you can see videos of your kids. You can buy a book on Amazon by touching once. And in transport, there are lots of friction points. So we heard about some of them. We heard about congestion. Um, but think about your own lives. There's, I can't have another drink. I've got to drive. I can't go out on Saturday night. The kids need that lift. Um, and so it makes complete sense to me that there will be massive public demand for some of these automated forms of transportation. And, you know, the self-driving car is not going to be a fringe product because all of us will find our life simplified by it. It will solve us the hassle of having to find a parking space. It will save the energy that we'd have personally spent driving around. Um, Wired did a cover on self-driving cars, and the big sales line was, text as much as you want, because you'll be able to multitask. And I actually think the cars could be here a lot more quickly than we're suggesting. And you've got people like Google with these gigantic visions of you know, transforming behavior. And Sergey Brin saying, well, we could have them by 2017 in some scale. It will take longer, but within a decade, I think it will be fairly commonplace. The other thing about exponential technologies and the network providing information to all sorts of people, so you get at our conference, the Y conference two weeks ago, we had Jack Andraka, who age 15 goes into a science lab and develops a diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer, he taught himself, which is 26,000 times um, cheaper than the existing test and even quicker and just as reliable. And you know, we're in a world now where anybody can get this information and make stuff. You can 3D print stuff, you can get access to factories. Um, so there's going to be a lot more innovations like Jerry's, I think, which involve sometimes relatively untested technologies. Maybe maglev is the one, maybe it's not, but there will be lots of attempts, and a lot of these will catch on. It doesn't just have to be one solution. It's going to be lower cost for entrepreneurs to take those big risks. Um, again, Robin is right that psychology is changing, and the 20th century obsession with ownership as a way of showing status, I think, is being eroded by the sharing economy that is every like you do on Facebook and every retweet you do. And that is massively transforming the economy now. People are sharing rooms in their homes with strangers on Airbnb. And it was a niche a couple of years ago. And at the moment, 140,000 rooms or beds a night are being rented out to strangers. Now, you could say rationally, why would people have strangers in their house? How unsafe is it if you're not there? But you develop a trust mechanism. Um, so I think a combination of new technologies, um, new business models, and new ways of expressing ourselves will catch on. And I also think it comes back to basic human psychology. We can very easily be hacked. We can be nudged. If you create a signless traffic junction, it makes us concentrate more. You, know, you don't need to be Daniel Kahneman and you know, have your heuristics list to realize how we're just pieces of software that can be manipulated quite easily. So I think the challenge for the regulators is being ballsy enough to allow these experiments and then measuring the experiments to see what works and what can scale up. And if there is a, you know, a fatal crash in one of these experiments, not to be slowed down in our willingness to take these chances to try and build a better future. So I think we have to be an optimist. You have to be prepared for a world where you know, maybe it's going to be drones that are going to help transport us. There's an entrepreneur I got to know who's trying to build Matternet, which is the physical internet with drones carrying goods automatically. They can go about 10 or 15 kilometers. I'm um, trying to build a mesh, a mesh network so you can deliver stuff to African villages in the, ra the rainy season. Um, 
there are new ways in which smart people are coming from completely unexpected places to solve problems. The grand challenges that competitions like the X Prize come up with and the DARPA grand challenges where the self-driving car emerged means there are teams who are not necessarily experts, who are finding ways to do things that the so-called experts would never have thought about. Um, so I would say, let a hundred flowers bloom. Um, let all these potential solutions be tried. And hack this audience's psychology as much as you can, because I think they'll be the beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask the panel all one question. Um, it's going to be really unfair because Paul is going to have to answer it first and you'll hear about it in a moment and you have to think incredibly quickly on his feet, but that's okay because you went to Oxford, so you're fine. Um, and then when they've all answered that question, I'm going to open it up for your, uh, your question. So uh, the question, um, um, it, it, there was a famous survey done of... Um, uh, professors in the 1960s, I think, where they were asked to predict the future, scientists, they were asked to predict the future. And, and actually, uh, they didn't do badly when it came to technology. They kind of got something that looked a bit like the internet as, as an idea. They had various other kind of thoughts. They might have got to flying vehicles slightly earlier than we got to flying vehicles, but it wasn't bad. They totally failed to predict the decline of the traditional family. So they did nothing effect, they didn't predict social changes. So they got technology right, but they got the social change completely wrong. So I'm interested, panel, in when you look at the conversations we've been having, what do you think are the, the social changes that might be the most important ones driving changes in the way in which we move around in the technology that we use? And very unfairly, unfairly Paul, I'm throwing that first at you. So um, uh, this is untestable, isn't it? Because you're asking me to make a prediction that you can't check right but now. I'm, so I can say all things. I think... <clears throat> I think something that's going to make a very big difference with machines in general, not just cars, but the robots that will be doing surgery on you, uh, the robots that might be helping you in your homes, certainly defending you and driving you, is data sharing, such that we should not be thinking about single entities that act independently, but we'll be thinking of entities that have access we use this word experiences, the experiences of all cars that are sharing data, and that's when they'll get good. Imagine if you as a young driver had instant access to every situation that involved a cow in fog on Dartmoor. And I bring that up because it was, I just passed my driving test, it took me six attempts, and... Did it um, really take you six attempts? It did, because there was forward. this issue with getting reverse confused with forwards and crashing into the test centre wall. Right, OK. Um, <clears throat> there is this ambiguity for I'm going to give you a car for that. <laughs> so good. Right. It's untestable. Um, yeah, so... And, you know, I, I was on Dartmoor, and um, I made a mistake with a cow in the fog. Um, and... Who if, came out of it worse? <laughs> well, it's a thing I haven't really talked about much, but, I mean... <laughs> If I had had access to every experience of all drivers that had been in a similar situation, like a car might, imagine what could happen there. Now, if we start to say we're going to share our driving skills and our driving ability and all the things that have ever happened and cars, because everything's connected, because memory is for all, in purposes, for all purposes infinite, there is no limit to what we can store, then I think some extraordinary things start to happen, and it so, happens in uh, robotics as well. But we've got to allow ourselves to collectively help ourselves by letting go some of our driving so, data. So what I'm hearing from that as a social thing is that w we think of cars as the ultimate kind of acquisitive, individualistic thing. You're saying that cars will we'll not think of cars in that side. We'll think of cars as parts of a network rather than... I think and that, that changes our relationship well, you with might, cars. You might still feel you've got an individual car, but it's got access to right. all the things that have been driven and all driving experiences. And then we make ourselves robust, because collectively, we're not bad. Individually, when we're tired, we're shocking. So why don't we get rid of that outlier of the shocking behaviour and have access to all the good things we did when we were driving? And now think about that not just in cars. Think about it of all computers and all machines that will serve you. And the world is a different and exciting place. Robin, what do you think is the major social change taking place in the background that's going to influence and change the way we think about transport? Climate change. Uh, so I, we haven't at all talked about that, and I don't even, I can't, couldn't look 50 years out. I couldn't, 30 years out, 20. 
in 20 years is going to be a dramatically different world, and I think we'll have very different priorities, and the expensive, jewel-like, crazy, whatever, we're not going to be doing any of that. But to his point, Paul's point, it talks about the beauty of the collective experience. If my, my optimism comes to part of that, that if I think of what we have to do in the next 20 years is going to, I think we can achieve it if we think of the collective intelligence as in building platforms for participation where we can tap into individuals' unique, spectacular skill sets. And not everyone will be coming up with that particular thing, but as you know, the person who was 15 who came up with whatever, I think in the world at large is going to be able, we will hopefully be able to tap into those amazing innovations and great breakthroughs. But I think climate change is the single largest anything that is shaping everything. Can I just try one more question, Ibram, which is, I'm increasingly convinced that, that radical change is more likely to happen at city level than national level, because city politics seems so much more kind of dynamic, right. and businesses and right. political leaders work more effectively together. Do you, do you in, in your business, in this debate, do you sense that it's more at the metro level that we're going to see innovation rather than national level? Yes, because that's where there's more people. One of the things about this collective piece is that the power of people and individuals being recognized for their own individual contribution, since there's more people in cities, I would say that's the case. But now we're... Someone just got into MIT. I was reading this letter that is from, like, Tibet. And how did he ever get here was he did an online course. He scored the highest in this online engineering course. And they flew him in and said, welcome with a full scholarship. I might have that story slightly wrong, but it was mm. from a person from a dramatically, incredibly remote rural place. So I think it's the power of tapping into individuals that we'll see. And certainly around politics, absolutely. We're seeing that cities are movers. Jerry, what do you think is the big social change? I'll just that add, I, I'm familiar with that story. And in fact, what, what turned out is that it took that fellow more time to get from Logan Airport to MIT than it did from Tibet to <laughs> Logan Airport. <laughs> Um, the, the World Series was happening. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think uh, to, to take um, Robin's point a bit further, it's Asia, the rise of Asia, because in Asia, there is no infrastructure. It's not as though the infrastructure is bad, but if you travel in India, India Philippines, Indonesia, um, there simply are no roads. And just like South America jumped over the stage of the wired telephone directly to cell phones, I think we're going to see Asia jump over private car use very quickly because in China already there are congested cities and you cannot get anywhere to anywhere. So I think they're going to be the first adapters, and we're seeing it with Skytran, that they will be the first adapters of this new technology that allows them to move because driving is not fun anymore. Ben, what do you think are the big kind of so? So, I mean, no one's talked about population aging, for example, which is an interesting no, thing as, as, as a driver in this. So, what do you see as being the kind of big social changes, a backdrop to all this? I think I think there are two uh, issues which um, are extremely important, just to add to the mix. The first is the uh, realization of the potential for social protocols to define what we do, rather than government regulation, and that changes the relationship between. The, the states and communities and individuals. If in 1983 at that uh, prediction, you, you predicted, well, you know, but, but do you think by the end of the century we'll be outlawed smoking in all public buildings, public transport, uh, pubs, clubs, cinemas? People say, you're crazy. How are you going to enforce that? We don't even find the police for to, to prevent that. Well, we've done it, and no one in here would ever dream of lighting a cigarette now there's no, no smoking signs, not because it's against the law, but because we've internalized an extremely strong but didn't social the law protocol. Didn't, I was actually involved in that legislation. Did the law actually The law had, had to, to signal that change. But, but the reason that now it defines our behavior is because of remarkable social protocols that we're capable of developing very fast. The other big change is that cities like this one, um, any market town like Poynton or any village is now redundant for the first time ever in human history, our markets, our towns, we have no more functional purpose to physically bring goods and services together in one place. The uh, internet or out-of-town superstores mean that you can, if you so choose, not wish to participate in the city, the marketplace of the city at all. The only reason that cities 
will thrive and they will continue to do so is because we wish to participate and to interact, not because we have to. Mm. And this shift from cities being functional necessities to being optional places that we choose to uh, interact with one another uh, has enormous implications for the way we value public space and the buildings and frame and the stage on which we interact. And I think that that will be the biggest change in the next few years. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I've got two cars left, I'm, so I'm still waiting for some fantastic questions. Uh, I'm open up. What I'll do is I'm going to take five questions from the room, and then I'm going to ask the panel to choose one of those questions <laughs> that they're particularly interested in, or one or two, before we uh, finish off. Okay, I'm just kind of like surveying the room. I'll take the woman right at the back first. Thank you. Uh, in more developed economies, the, one of the significant contributors to more traffic in cities... Tell us your name, sorry. Mikhail Brack. Okay. Uh, significant contributors to uh, uh, congestion in cities is uh, delivery vehicles for all of our online shopping. So how do these solutions um, help to help with that? And then in less developed economies, a big problem in cities is just moving people around at very low cost um, on very basic transport like buses. So how do these solutions help with that? Okay, problem? so two questions in one. One's kind of delivery vehicles, and the other one's just about how do you make it incredibly cheap for people who've got very, very little money. So remember those two questions. There's a gentleman uh, uh, there. Second row from the back. Good evening. My name is Amit, as in MIT. Uh, my question is, smarter mobility, uh, throughout this evening, we've talked about the mobility of people. But what about the mobility of the goods? What are the smarter ways of transporting our goods, which, which is a larger part of mobility as well? Good. So that's kind of a bit like the delivery question. Yeah, yeah, goods and delivery. Okay. There's a gentleman there in a blue, sky blue sweater, I think. There it goes. Here it comes. Not moving that quickly. Not moving reasonably quickly. Here it comes. Great. Yeah. So, Morris, could there be a comment on is smarter mobility less mobility? Is smarter mobility less mobility? Okay, very good. And I'll take the lady back there. I seem to be choosing the most awkward possible people for you. I'm terribly sorry. Okay. Motorists contribute... Sorry, my name is Sarah. I'm from the RAC. Um, motorists contribute about £45 billion to the UK economy. How does the panel um, you know, think that that's going to be replaced through new technology? Very good. I think you asked that question so you could get that statistic in, didn't you? But, uh, no, but you did it very well, very elegantly. Nobody would have noticed. Um, right, there's someone right at the back there with a pair of glasses. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ravi Gogner. Um, you haven't talked really about public transport and alternative modes, such as cycling and, and that kind of thing. Um, how do you think that fits in with your smart mobility world? Okay, so, so I think we've got kind of a couple of themes. We've got a kind of really cheap transport, bikes and all that kind of stuff, and we've got kind of goods and delivery as well playing around. Okay, uh, what's, uh, who's next? Yeah, there's someone else in the back row just because you're looking really tired. Um, hi, my name's Joy Tuffield, and I'm a clean tech investor. Um, a what? Climate change solutions, investing in climate change solutions. Um, I'm fascinated by the sharing economy, but... Uh, the question that I have is, is this is, it, is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, car sharing and ride sharing and the zip cars of the world, is this a function of uh, the, the recession and people not really having that much kind of cash at hand? Oh, or yeah. is it uh, a kind of a shift, a generational shift in attitude to assets itself? Yeah, very, you know, if we're rich again, well, we all just kind of buy really huge cars. And yeah, yeah that's a really good question. Okay, uh, and then there's a gentleman there in the middle. We'll take a couple more, and then we'll come back to you, panel. What do you think... Uh, Tell us your name. Andrew Haynes. Hi, Andrew. What will be the impact of the changing patterns of work on transport in the future? Ah, or will there be changing patterns? We've been predicting these changing patterns of work for a long time, and they still haven't really occurred, as we know when we get on the Northern Line in the morning. OK, uh, there's a guy there in a white top with oars on it.
Uh, Jason Lubbock, uh, you've all mostly talked about kind of cutting down driving, um, cutting down the amount of cars, but what about driving for fun or driving for passion or the love of cars that a lot of people have? Okay, all right, brilliant. Bit of a Jeremy Clarkson question there. And then back, <laughs> no, nothing, not there's anything wrong with it. And then to the back row there. Yeah. Hi, You're not sharing is... my bloody car, that's what he's saying, right? Go on. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ben Glatz. I've got a very short question. Do you think high speed rail 2 is smart? Uh, you don't have to answer that if you're a foreigner, because it's, uh, it's not really fair on you. Okay, and then I'm... Oh, f oh, finally, yes, you got a nice smile. <laughs> I'm not saying you two haven't got nice smiles, but he was just, you know... Hi, uh, Pratik Sureka. Uh, my question is for the uh, developing nations, where people are really inspired to buy bigger cars, fancy cars. How do you absorb that inspiration, that generation that's coming up, to uh, adapt to the smarter mobility? Okay, inspire that. Yeah, very good. All right, so panel, you've got all sorts of interesting themes. I'm sorry for the people I didn't, I didn't call. You've only got 90 seconds each. Uh, what I've picked out of that is uh, there's a questions around uh, goods and deliveries, and we haven't really talked about all that kind of commercial transport. Um, I think there's a rumbling around the room that has been going on all the evening, which is, isn't it really that we just need to travel less, or is that you know pie in the sky? We're, you know, it's just not going to happen. We had the question about is there ever going to be this. Uh, pr long predicted change in working patterns as a consequence? Is that going to be one of the issues that flows uh, into all of this? And we've had questions about uh, how do we influence people in the developing world and also about what about the cheapest forms of transport for people who've got no money at all and cycling and all of that. Is there a bit of this story which is all about assuming people have got a certain amount of income? I haven't probably covered everything, but you heard all the questions, so you can pick other ones if you want to. Robin, I'm going to start with you. Just pick a couple of things. I'll go quickly. It clearly, car sharing is clearly not recession-based since I launched that company in 2000 and it succeeded every single recession. It's gone through and grown through all of them. Um, it's just smarter, cheaper, and better. Uh, do I, what, I, what do I think about the 45 billion pounds or million pounds or whatever? Got I was, that fact twice now. Uh, <laughs> I, I was in Paris and I went to the sewer museum and before they built sewers, there were 20,000 water carriers in the city of Paris who would carry water in and water out. Are we sorry that we don't have those 20,000 jobs? No. Um, the other question up there was, <laughs> uh, sorry, we'll be replaced with something else. Uh, more massages and great d takeouts. Take up, yeah, I have no idea. Uh, you need to go theater. back to the RAC and tell them to get um, into massage. There was another question of uh, 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 just around trans uh, freight. It is a huge issue, and I'm not on freight, but I do know because I believe that there's a huge amount of excess capacity in those delivery vehicles, and I'm certain that we could do a better, more efficient job, better, cheaper, more efficient job of moving that around if we focused on excess capacity and. Uh, made people able to share that. And I think there was another car sharing question. That's fine, that's fine, that's great. Two. Okay, Jerry. I'll talk about the freight. Um, FedEx, DHL, all those companies take more time to deliver your package from the airport to your city destination than it takes them to fly it from wherever they're flying it from to Memphis or wherever else they're going. So it's actually that part of the urban transportation that takes up a lot of time, clogs traffic, causes a lot of pollution. SkyTran addresses all of that. You could drop a package in a SkyTran vehicle. It would go directly to your destination. You don't have to fill the surface with those big uh, UPS trucks. With regards to car sharing and computerized driving, I think it's terrific. I think clearly the younger generation and, else, and other folks in other parts of the world, but I'm speaking of North America, the younger generation is no longer enamored with car ownership. You can see it. People just want to use the car to get from A to B. They don't want to necessarily own the car. However, using the car, use of cars is rising. It's not diminishing. Worldwide, the number of cars on the road, driving, congestion is all going up. We're not seeing it going down. I think we're reaching a tipping point, and I think that's why we will see more and more alternative solutions to driving. Very good. Ben, pick up a couple of points. I, I just wanted to come back on the question of is smart mobility less mobility? Because it's an inter a very interesting question. And I think one of the exciting things of our time and certainly the last hundred years has been an awareness about evolution and therefore who we are as a species and our relationship to the other great apes and, and so forth. But clearly, one of the, uh, the things that's important to humans is exchange and interaction. And by definition, that means some form of communication or mobility. So 
Um, I, 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 apparently, um, only 30 years ago, a farmer on the eastern shores of Iceland would encounter in his or her lifetime 300 people. Nowadays, we meet 300 people in a week, easily. Um, and the, clearly, there appears to be a, a, a driving force, both economic and social, behind our words, to maximize your encounters, the intrigue, the interest uh, in life. And I wouldn't change places with that Icelandic farmer, uh, even where I have a very solid, solid solitude is monk. Um, but so I don't. I think that we have to accept mobility as a uh, a human desire, but not for its own right, but because it allows us uh, intrigue, um, un, uh, surprises, uh, uncertainties. It challenges us. It brings us in in, in contact with a greater number of people, and that as um, Stephen Pinker has so articulately described recently, it reduces violence. Very good. Okay. Uh, David. Unless, of course, pandemics mean we're scared of leaving our village because nature tends to win. Um, so we're talking about the economics and we're talking about environmental reasons, but there's a fundamental frustration that more of us are going to have about needless early death at scale, which is what we have every day on our roads. I don't know what the figure in the UK is. It's something about 4,000 deaths. In the US, it's 34,000 a year. Sorry? 1,760. So you declined. do get a car. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 1,760. So it's been declining. Yeah. But there it's are been still... declining? Yeah, 6,562 in 1917. I think a round of applause for this. That's absolutely... <laughs> do you... Do you work in this area? Yeah. Oh, it's been a slightly <laughs> morbid uh, hobby, I have, to, <laughs> I have to say. Sorry, David. But if you think of the Crowd scale of the suffering <laughs> and of family economic loss by the injuries and the deaths, um, then it's a no-brainer to develop safer technologies using data analytics, using very, very low-cost sensors, using LiDAR cameras, which the automated machines can deliver. And it's a no-brainer that you know, government investment goes into projects like that rather than something like a high-speed rail service that will be technologically redundant by the time it's built, but it's led by politicians who keep changing their minds. And I think the same, the, the same shift is... Just look at what's happening in healthcare at the moment. So there's a massive rise in investment in innovative, often digital, health companies because we now have genomic science, we have data analytics, we have portable, very low-cost sensors. And I keep meeting very ambitious startup founders. I met one on Saturday who says, yeah, my company's solving cancer because we're taking information that was in silos about which treatment regimes, which cancers were effective, and we're creating a massive public accessible database. And it takes a few bold entrepreneurs, and it takes you know, the Elon Musk trying to make electric cars sexy or trying to come up with a Hyperloop idea um, to solve these problems which will benefit our lives and our health at scale. And I think Brilliant. you can't argue with that. And then finally, Paul, and then panel, right at the end, I'm, I didn't warn you this, horrible on what I'm about to issue. I'm going to ask all of you in a moment to choose one of the other people to invest in. Okay, uh, <laughs> Paul. You talked, Briefly. About, you talked about cars being attractive in the developing world. A car that drives itself is pretty fancy. So if a Nissan Micro could drive itself because it's a text file and that's pretty fancy. You talked about a passion for driving. Great. Knock yourself out. Enjoy it. And when you're old, I expect you still like cars. And when your sight's failing or if you've had a fit, I hope you never do, you must still would like to get in your car. You talk about £45 million for the RAC. Great. Why not 60? Let's have more cars being more mobile doing a better job. You talk about moving goods. She prefers that to massage, I think. <laughs> have a massage while you're driving. You talk about, you talk about goods. OK, that is interesting. Um, it's an asymmetric problem. We thought about getting goods from the factory into the vans. That's easy. We can think about getting the vans to drive themselves. Meh, it will happen. The last 10 yards that's tricky. And every time the Sainsbury's guy comes around to my house, I sort of have my head on its side thinking, your job's really pretty secure for now because I've parked my car really badly and you're lifting the bags past this. That last part for delivery for goods is quite hard. Having said that, people are goods. 
but if you can, it's just a, it's just a payload. You just wanted to go and do a thing. So there's a big, big market for smarts, full stop for moving stuff around, and the machines are coming, and it's going to be good. You need to be ready. Okay, panel. So this is your final unfair question. We've got here driverless cars. You can invest in driverless cars. We've got here shared car solutions. You can invest in shared car solutions. We've got here the weird floating thing. <laughs> you know, you all Sky saw train. it. Skytran, that's the one. I knew that. I knew that. And here we've got new urban, de urban design consultants just kind of doing all that lovely stuff there. So you've all got to choose. You've got to invest in each. You can't invest in yourself, I'm afraid. You've got to choose one of, one, one of your pan pa panelists you're going to invest a million pounds in. David, who are you going to invest in? Well, I can't invest oh, in come Paul on, just because there's big well-funded public companies that are going to try and do the same things for profit motives very quickly. Um, I would have invested in Robin because she's got a great track record as an entrepreneur. Um, but I think I'm... As, can I have a fund that gives me a chance oh, to kind of... Say, just chew! <laughs> Eight o'clock. <laughs> can, I, can I kind of have enough fun to back Jerry to fail two or three times before he finally gets it right. Very because good. Okay, you're backing Jerry. All right, Ben. Well, what, what happened there? I certainly, I certainly wouldn't uh, invest in traffic signals, uh, I have to say. I, I would, I would, uh, but I think that it's a, a no-brainer that I would invest in Robin. Not only is she, is she wonderful, but she's a successful entrepreneur, and the sharing economy is clearly uh, here to stay. Very good. Okay, it's between Jerry and... You won't vote for Robin. <laughs> tactically. Tactically. Who are you going to vote for? That's correct. Well, well... Um, even though I still cannot send a file from my Mac to a PC, <laughs> I, will, I will invest You're in You're investing Paul. in Paul. Yes, but Very tactically good. because I Getting think Robin yeah. So, Robin. <laughs> you know I have to invest in Ben only because he voted for me. No, because um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, enhancing the livability of cities is going to be a major focus everywhere. So you're voting for Ben. Right, Paul, this, this is the crucial vote. And I, I, I'm with Robin for shared driverless cars. Very good. Robin, Robin, oh. Robin. <laughs> uh, well, look, it's been an absolutely fantastic uh, evening. Uh, thanks to Shell for sponsoring it, for Intelligence Squared for making it happen. Thank you to you for asking such wonderful questions I got rid of. Uh, all my cars, but most of all, I'd like you to thank our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.